Hey guys, Mr. Happy here and today we are going to go over the strategy for the new raid, the Crystal Tower. This raid is designed to be taken on by 24 players of an average item level of at least 50 and can be unlocked in Revenant's Toll in Mordona by completing the questline starting with the Legend of the Alag from the Outlandish Man. This raid can only be queued up with a maximum of 8 people. The remaining 16 will randomly be thrown together through the Duty Finder or other pre-made groups. Should you wish to tackle the Crystal Tower with 24 people of your free company currently, you must have all three parties made, tick a language that is less popular in the Duty Finder menu, queue at the same time, and try to see if everyone's queue pops similarly. Have fun with that. Once inside, you'll notice that the Crystal Tower is quite massive, but don't let its size fool you. With the instance tuned for an item level 50, most groups should be able to tackle the challenges in here with relative forgivability, so long as there is a slight bit of communication between the alliances. It is generally accepted to go down the left side first, then go back to the right side, then forward before facing off against the final boss. So let's cover the trash and boss on the left side first. This trash, like a lot of other trash in the 4-man dungeons, will try to slightly teach you the mechanics of the following boss. Trash is handled very differently in the Crystal Tower, with each trash pool being confined into a boss-like room. The trash doesn't drop any treasure coffers, the rooms are just there to confine you like this to deal with an additional dungeon mechanic. The mechanic for these trash pools are the platforms of varying heights that you see. After pulling the trash and a set amount of time passes, deadly fluids will rise and cover a portion of the room. First it will cover the lowest elevation, before rising once more to make it so that only the tallest platforms are safe to stand on. Standing in the water will deal several hundred damage per second, so be hasty moving across it if you have to. The following three trash pulls, as well as the boss, will have this mechanic. The first trash pull are several homunculus, which are elementals of varying element, and two valifers, dragons with strong rear cone attacks. One important note for these pulls is that you will be locked in while you will be locked in the room, these mobs are not all linked, so feel free to pull them one at a time for safety. Though realistically, if you're using the duty finder, expect one of your groups to just pull the whole thing. Kill the homunculus before dealing with the dragons. Homunculus, homunculi, eh, doesn't matter. Remember to keep the dragons rear facing away from your raid. Kill them and move on to trash pull number two. The next trash has several imps and a couple of demons. The imps are really squishy and the demons don't do anything special really, so just kill that, kill the imps, kill the demons, and then move on to trash pull number three. This trash pull has a very few platforms to stand on, and mobs will move that will mobs will use moves that will try to make you move off of them. The Arimon have level 5 Petrify, which will deal its damage in a cone and, well, petrify you if your level is equal to a uh, multiple of level 5. Don't know why I had such a hard time saying that. But uh Basically, it'll petrify you, since everyone in here will be level 50. Uh, just avoid the cone. You can stun and silence the Ahriman, so definitely just prevent them from doing this move. Also, there will be several uh, succubi named Deeras, and they are a bit more deadly. They have Void Fire 2, which I'm sure you're familiar with at this point, which will deal AoE damage to a set location. I recommend stunning and silencing this as well, so people don't have to move off the platform. They also have Dark Mist, which deals damage and inflicts terror to nearby enemies. Again, stun this. Kill the trash, and let's move on to the first boss, the Bone Dragon. Bone Dragon's room is set up similarly to the trash, with the three elevations of platforms, as well as several max height ones in a row projecting outward from his central platform. Keep these platforms in mind for the water rising mechanic, since it still does a lot of damage if you stand in it. Most groups will fight Bone Dragon on the central platform, though keep in mind he can be pulled to anywhere in the room for varying alliance strategies. He has a breath attack that inflicts terror, as well as a small AoE around him that deals a few hundred damage. Additionally, he will occasionally do AoE to a random platform around the room that has players on it, just to deal some damage to the ranged while he's at it. This does moderate damage to anyone that it hits, but it's nothing too concerning. While he has very little HP, you must kill the Bone Dragon a total of three times to end the encounter, and this is the primary mechanic of the encounter. During his lifespan, for the first two, for his first two lives, we'll call them, he will summon two sets of three skeletons. These skeletons will deal moderate physical damage, but their primary mechanic is to slow down the raid from killing the bone dragon too fast. Each skeleton must be dragged to a faraway platform and killed before the bone dragon himself dies. When the bone dragon dies, he will raise all the dead skeletons with a moderate slow debuff. These skeletons will then begin slowly trotting towards the boss. If they reach him, they will explode and deal about 1500 damage in a raid-wide AoE. Two or three skeletons doing this back-to-back -back will definitely mean a wipe for your raid. 
If any skeletons are still alive when the bone dragon dies, they will instead have no slow debuff and run very fast towards the dragon, meaning a likely explosion. This only happening once isn't the end, but try to avoid it happening at all. Also, if two skeletons die on the same platform, they will also be able to run fast, so you want the dragon to as many different outside platforms as possible. If you're in a pinch with the bone dragon's HP dropping too quickly and you need to kill a skeleton with no time to kite, kill it on one of the closer platforms and just focus it down whenever it revives. You are not required to kill them on the farthest platforms, it just gives you the most time to kill all six. After this, bone dragon will revive and phase one will, re will repeat again. In phase two, however, the water will be rising, so you won't have as much room to move around the arena, at least not safely. Simply repeat phase one, kill the skeletons on faraway platforms, then kill the dragon, then kill the revived skeletons, and then move on to phase three. Now for phase three, he'll summon several sets of Ariman, which will run around hurting people. Have any tank currently not tanking Bone Dragon, pick these up and hold them while you burn down the Bone Dragon's final life, ending the encounter. There's no point in DPSing these Ariman as the boss will despawn them upon being killed the third time. So uh, the only other thing I can think to mention is that our tank has reported that a very, very powerful debuff will be placed on one of, on the main tank at some point. This is noted by a, a, a large red circle above their head. He said he took about 6k damage from this debuff every time that it hit him. So this may be technically trying to get tanks to force a tank swap, but as long as you pop hollowed ground, or as long as at least one tank is available on the Bone Dragon, even if a tank dies, this shouldn't be too big of a problem. Now grab your loots and use the shortcuts to quickly get to the trash before the second boss. The trash before the second boss requires your three parties in the alliance to split up and kill their own Atomos mini boss. While you will be interacting with other platforms mechanically, you cannot directly help them kill their platform or heal their groups. As you can see, Atomos is protected by a small ring circling around him which will make him invulnerable. The only way to remove this ring is for each party to have four members stand on the colored platforms closest to the entrance to unlock another group's Atomos. This usually means placing two ranged DPS and two healers on that platform, while two melee DPS kill Atomos. The two tanks will handle the constant barrage of enemies Atomos will spit out as you try to kill him. The tanks must tank the mobs away from the platform so that the four people on it are ensured that they are not being hit by AoEs or cone attacks that may cause them to have to move off the platform. For that reason, kill the Deeras first, since Voidfire 2 can be quite annoying. Also, make sure that the Valfers, again, don't have their backs facing any of the other people in your party. Should an entire alliance wipe on their platform, Iron Giants will spawn on the remaining platforms. These enemies will run around, spamming a giant cleave attack that will hit for 9,999 damage, wiping the remaining two alliances. If you have an alliance group that may be a bit less experienced or geared than the other groups, I recommend having them stand on the leftmost platform and kill the leftmost Atomos, while having your most geared and experienced group go down the middle. If the middle platform kills their Atomos the fastest, then the left group will not be required to stand on their light to light up the platform to unlock the middle group's Atomos, bring them up to move around and stay safe. The middle group still needs to stand on their platform though, and the third group still does need to stand on theirs. Kill the adds, kill the Atomos, and you'll be on the second boss, Thanatos. Thanatos has most moves that you'd expect from a Dullahan, including a giant cleave attack. Initially, he will be completely immune to all damage sources. However, there are three magic pots around the outside of the room, which will choose one party every 60 seconds and make them ghosts. This ghost party is the only party that can directly interact with Thanatos pretty much, meaning they are on quote unquote boss duty. The ghosted tank should pull aggro immediately, while the ghost DPS should do as much damage as possible to Thanatos in this time. If you're a ghost, do not attack any of the adds, just focus on Thanatos. The other two alliances will be on protection duty, meaning they will protect the magic pots from the adds and Thanatos' mechanics. Thanatos will summon several adds for the other two alliances to deal with. The Sandman adds are ghosts that will create a tether between themselves and a random magic pot. This designates which pot they are going to attack. If they reach the pot, they will proceed to damage it in an attempt to kill it. Kill these guys as quick as possible. He will also summon several Nemesis, which run around casting AoEs and doing cone attacks as well. Tank and kill these up ASAP. Occasionally, Thanatos will do a move where he stabs his sword into the ground and begins pulling the magic pots towards him. When this happens, make sure the ghost party pulls Thanatos away from them and faces him away so that he does not cleave them. Add alliances should heal them up to full at this time as well, just to be safe. 
Kill Thanatos quickly before moving on to the third boss, Trash. After heading up north to reach the third boss, you'll see three demons attached to an Allegan bomb in the center of a room. This signifies the next Trash Bolt, which can be quite troublesome for some parties. Each of these three demons must be tanked and killed by their own alliance before they can attack the Allegan bomb. The bomb itself will grow in size over the course of the encounter, both over time and through Trash mechanics. If he reaches full size, he will explode and wipe the raid, so be careful here. Each demon ad will do several AoEs, cones, and random range attacks native to that type of demon, so just deal with them as they come out. Additionally, the tethers between them play a vital role. If one player's tether is too short, the other demons will have a strong vulnerability up buff that will make them unable to take very much damage, so players must do their best to keep their demons at the far edges, edges of the platform. Additionally, they will summon giant puddles of fire occasionally, which just requires a tank to move them over slightly. Oh, and standing in the lava does damage on the outside of the arena. All that lava, it does damage, as one would expect. But you can go through it to sort of get into position, so don't be that afraid to move through it if you're not so confident in your uh, the ability to avoid aggro on the demons. During this encounter, two types of adds will spawn, Allegan Balloons and Allegan Napalm. Allegan Balloons should be tanked and killed so that they don't deal unnecessary raid damage. They may have some additional mechanic built into them, but I didn't see any sort of interaction with the Allegan Bomb, nor were they ever alive long enough to do anything themselves. I'm assuming that if you don't kill them quick enough, bad things will happen though, so just kill them quick enough. The Allegan Napalm, on the other hand, cannot be tanked, and as soon as they spawn, will begin moving towards the Allegan Bomb in the center of the room. If any Napalms reach the bomb, he will greatly grow in size, pretty much wiping the raid since it will cause a bomb explosion. So kill the demons as quick as possible while dealing with the balloon and napalm spawns, then kill the bomb in the middle of the room with all three demons dead. This was the final trash pull of the raid. The next two encounters are bosses, with the first one being King Behemoth. King Behemoth can cause a few problems if people aren't paying attention, so let's go over his many mechanics. The first is that there is a constantly pulsing AoE for the entire encounter, designated by the electricity on the floor. Empowering this AoE are four towers at the corners of the arena. Each tower has a control panel, which will reset the tower stacks to zero. Place four of your tanks near these towers to power down the towers when they become too powerful, since you will only need two tanks for the encounter otherwise. I am told the best time to do this is when your own tower reaches two stacks. These control panels are not entirely safe, however, so don't think you tanks that are getting to do this get a free, ri get a free ride. Three types of ads will spawn. The first are comets that will come down on targets with a mark above their head. These comets are vital for surviving King, Be King Behemoth's most powerful move, so I recommend simply placing them somewhere in the south or east sides of the room. We'll go over more or less where not to place them as we discuss the other two types of adds. The first type of ad is an Iron Giant. This enemy has moderate HP and must be killed as quickly as possible. He has a strong cleave attack, which can not only harm the players, but it can destroy the control panels for the towers, making you unable to weaken the AoE around the room anymore. He can also cleave the comets, which you need if you want to survive the encounter. If the Iron Giant is actually brought too far from a comet, he will directly run towards it and begin to cleave it. For this reason, dropping comets, comets on the, roughly, south side of the arena and tanking the giant towards the west wall should mean that one is close enough in range for him to not move on his own, allowing him to be killed without much trouble. The other ad is a bomb ad. These also serve two purposes. Their primary purpose is to slowly move towards one of the four towers around the room. If they reach the tower, they will destroy its control panel, so DPS need to focus these down ASAP. Additionally, if there are any comets in their path and they touch that comet, they will blow it up. So you do not want to drop comets in between the center of the room and the four towers. This is why the other location I recommended is the east wall, to protect it from both the bombs and the giant. In reality, expect groups to put comets all over the room, so just as long as you have one comet alive somewhere, you should be alright. Now let's not forget about King Behemoth himself. He has several very strong attacks, including Trounce and Thunderstorm, which will both do very high conal damage. Make sure the main tank's HP is always kept high in case he does these two moves back to back, and I definitely recommend letting your most gear tank in all 24 of the players be the one to hold the boss. After several sets of adds, he will cast Ecliptic Meteor, which is the mechanic that you needed those comets for. Hide behind the comet facing King Behemoth and you should be safe from Meteor. 
Keep in mind that if a comet is either too close to King Behemoth or you stand within a comet during Meteor, since they actually have no collision detection, then it may kill you in either of the situations, so be careful. The only thing that will change after he does Meteor the first time is that now, for the rest of the fight, he will also cast Charybdis, which places a tornado at either the north, south, east, or west side of the arena. As far as I can tell, just did some AoE damage. Didn't affect the comments at all and didn't affect the ads at all. So just don't stand in it. Kill the ads, kill King Behemoth, and you'll unlock the final boss, Acheron. Acheron is a fun fight, and it's not too difficult to figure out. He hits moderately hard, but he also possesses several very flashy sword attacks. Shortly after your encounter starts, he will cover the very outside of the arena in fire, so just don't stand there. He has a normal cleave attack he'll do with a red indicator, but he also has several raid-wide AoEs, sort of. Megiddo Flame and Vacuum Slash will both do cone attacks in one direction of the room, while Abyssal Slash will do many arced red and black AoEs around the room. Simply don't stand in the colors. Acheron himself also has some just some raid-wide AoE damage. I believe it's called Quake, but it's just going to do some damage, so heal up from it. After about a third of his health is gone, Acheron will remove the fire along the outside and summon three claw adds. These claws have very little health, but will grab onto a single player and stun them until the claw is killed. Kill the claw and prepare for Acheron's most powerful move, Ancient Flare. When Acheron starts casting these, all members must run to the outside of the arena. There will be three large platforms players must stand on, and enough players must be standing on them before Ancient Flare is cast. Once enough players are on the platform, a barrier, barrier will appear and protect the raid from Ancient Flare. Failure to raise the platform will cause an instant wipe. It's best to assign each alliance to each platform, with A being the left one, B being the middle one, and C being the right one, so people always know where to run to to mitigate Ancient Flare. After you stop Ancient Flare, three Iron Giants will spawn. Kill them while avoiding their cleave attacks and wait for Ancient Flare's AoE to end. Once it does, continue the fight as normal. Acheron's attacks in this phase will become much, much bigger though. Vacuum Slash will cover about three-fourths of the room now with small safe areas, and Megiddo Flame will go outward in several small cones instead of just one. Abyssal Slash will now also have many more slashes, but the same rule applies. Don't stand in the pretty colors. Occasionally, the Claw Adds will spawn from the platforms and grab onto players. Just kill them as you normally would, until one-third of Acheron's health is remaining. This will sign signal another Ancient Flare cast, which you handle the same way you did before. More Iron Giants will spawn after that, and when they are dead, you just move on to the final phase. The only new thing in this phase is 100 Cuts, which will do a weave of AoEs around the room that deal high damage to anyone hit by them. Dodge the pretty colors, kill Acheron, and congratulations! The entirety of this raid rewards 200 Philosophy and 50 Mythology Tome Stones. Anyway guys, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, favorite, subscribe, and share for more Final Fantasy XIV information and videos, as well as some other Final Fantasy videos I'll be posting over time. Also, feel free to follow me on Facebook and Twitter where you can get regular updates about the videos I'm posting or ask me questions. Of course, feel free to follow me on Twitch where I do stream Final Fantasy XIV as well as some classic Final Fantasies and we'll be streaming some other things for the year of 2014. But anyway, guys, thanks for watching and until next time, take care.